Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to give everybody just a few seconds to get logged on before we get started. Okay, perfect. So thank you for joining us for our first webinar of 2022. This is going to be a good one. Um, if you prefer to call into today's webinar, you can do so. Um, then you can use the phone number and the webinar ID on the screen. Um, if you have a question as our presenters are speaking, please type it into the Q&A box. Um, Shannon's going to be watching over that to answer any of your questions. Um, and we will make sure that the speakers uh, get your questions. Um, a reminder for any media joining us, we ask that you formally announce your participation and refrain from quoting any of the discussion during the webinar. Um, if you would like any direct quotes, we encourage you to follow up with our presenters. We also now offer closed captioning on all of our webinars. Um, you just have to click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to begin. Um, we also have Spanish translation services available. Uh, you can just click the link that's posted in the chat by Shannon, and it will take you to uh, the translation page. So for today, we are going to be discussing 2022 policy priorities for the rare disease community. Um, we are going to get started with Nicholas Minetto from Fager Drinker Consulting. We're then going to have Jamie Sullivan give us uh, policy priorities for the Every Life Foundation. Ellie Dahani from Research America, David Davenport from the Personalized Medicine Coalition, and Jennifer Dexter from the National Health Council. And last but not least, Shannon is going to give us an update on Rare Disease Week. Nicholas, I will pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, great to be here today, and uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, sorry, I can't be on video, but I'm actually on the way up to a, an in-person Hill meeting, so we'll transit today. But happy to talk for a few minutes about uh, the legislative landscape here in healthcare that we're looking at as we head deeper into 2022. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So I think most, if not everyone on the call knows that the, the, the congressional agenda has really been dominated by uh, you know, two core issues, at least for the past several weeks and in some ways months, you know, one being the, the Build Back Better Act and the second being voting rights and election reform legislation. And, you know, this all happening even up to last night with the Senate attempt to overcome some of the filibuster uh, prohibition or limits on the election uh, reform bill uh, playing out. So we, we're seeing this really is dominating a lot of the uh, focus on the chambers, particularly in the Democratic caucus. And um, it's, it's creating a lot of uncertainty. I've had you know, three or four Hill meetings over the past two days and uh, Dem and R and basically everyone's message is the same, that there's a, a ton of cloudiness out there as we continue to see how things will play out, including potentially working through uh, carving up each one or both of these bills into pieces that could be, um, could be navigated or could be, could be passed. We're also on top of that stuck in a continuing resolution or temporary spending for fiscal year 2022 through at least the middle of February and potentially um, longer than that. On the, the politics of it, you know, Democrats I think are increasingly concerned and Republicans increasingly optimistic about the outcomes in the 2022 midterms. Um, and we know politics will continue to dominate all of these decisions even more so as we go um, each passing day and week as we get closer to November. You've also got the continued uh, stream of retirements, including a number of longstanding members on both sides, particularly those in the more middle or establishment no sides of their uh, respective caucuses, which will continue to uh, bring about a dynamic where you're going to have probably more um, partisan caucuses and lawmakers with less experience on Capitol Hill, uh, which can cause some certainly some challenges for stakeholders. If we can go to the next slide. There we go. So, you know, the, the conventional wisdom in climate and times like this, usually with any election cycle, um, you know, the expectation is that there's going to be limited legislating as we reach a certain point with all the energy uh, consumed and focused on the midterm elections. Of course, there are always um, 
extraordinary situations or uh, to, to, any, to any rule or any um, historical wisdom. And I think what we saw two years ago with the COVID pandemic, which forced Congress to act in a number of ways on big ticket legislation is a good example of how crises or other unexpected events can and will change and influence the agenda. So obviously anything can happen depending on where things go over the next few weeks and months on any number of hot topics, whether it be COVID, whether it be uh, various foreign relations issues that are playing out and the like. So that could change, that could drive Congress to become more active. But you know, if barring those events, I think the anticipation is that we will see uh, limited legislating, limited outcomes at least up until the election cycle. And then you've got this lame duck session when they come back in November and December. And obviously very much TBD and much of that will be influenced by the outcome of the election and who's gonna be standing where come early 2023. We've seen lame duck sessions that are very minimal. We've seen lame ducks like two years ago that were very consequential with several thousand pages of legislation enacted at the very end of the year. Um, but much of that legislation of course had been in the works during the year. Uh, so while in a big package at the end of the year, it wasn't a complete surprise, just done in one fell swoop. Can we move to the next slide? So just let's think for a minute about, you know, what has to happen and then what is on the radar and what may be likely to happen as we think through, you know, for the community and for other stakeholders, how things can play out. So like I mentioned earlier, we're in a situation where the fiscal year is funded through the middle of February. So Congress will have to act in a month's time to either extend that deadline further through another temporary measure or potentially, and I think many of us would hope that they will be able to, if not fully in mid-February, but soon thereafter, um, enact a year-long um, omnibus or massive spending bill. And then on top of that, they will have to address fiscal year 23, uh, which will start officially on October 1. So there's gonna be this period of time where uh, very soon the appropriations and budget committees will be having to look at essentially a, a two-front battle here, resolving FY22 while also laying the groundwork for fiscal year 2023. Keep in mind potential for emergency spending, supplemental spending that's been in the news, as many of you have seen over the past few days, uh, particularly related to the pandemic or other uh, responses to natural disasters. And then of course, COVID response. Um, Got to keep this on the radar, particularly as our healthcare providers are increasingly been stretched thin. There's a growing clamor from providers in particular about um, a number of different responses, including things like delaying the um, resumption of the Medicare sequester or trimming or payment reduction for healthcare providers that is supposed to take effect or start going back into effect come uh, Q1, Q2 at the uh, beginning of April. You know, there are things like that that I think we'll start to see more attention toward, uh, particularly as providers continue to navigate this um, wave of the pandemic and those challenges. Can we go to the next slide, please. So just building upon you know, what else has to be done or at least if not have to be done should be on the radar. A few things for us to keep in mind for our communities in particular, uh, the FDA user fee package that has to be done. Uh, Congress will have to reauthorize by the end of this fiscal year, the ability for FDA to uh, enter into user fee negotiation uh, payments with various uh, industries. So that's something that typically happens during the spring and summer of the year. Um, we know there'll be some hearings starting up, I think on energy and commerce, even late, uh, early February. So that process is, is in play and it's something that we need to keep an eye on, particularly since those user fee bills, as we all know, are often a chance for Congress to legislate on other uh, FDA related items. Uh, telehealth extension, there's a ton of interest as I think all of you know in uh, more permanently or at least continuing to extend on a temporary basis the uh, flexibilities and rules that enabled an expansion of telehealth during the pandemic. Uh, so very much something that stakeholders are looking to achieve a more long-term uh, stability on. We have a need to enact, reauthorize Medicaid funding for our five territories. You've also got, you know, we had a action done last year to increase the premium tax subsidies for exchange purchases. So that's another item that Congress will have to act on by the end of the year, or those will return to their prior levels. Uh, you've got interest in potentially revisiting how we respond to pandemics um, over on the HELP Committee. 
and then you've got the Senate Finance Committee doing some things on mental and behavioral health, including an upcoming hearing with our Surgeon General that also has some bipartisan backing. So th the main nugget here is that there is now, we're seeing some more committee activity while we're still stuck in a bit of neutral with these big ticket items. Committees are moving forward with some of these other items that either have to happen or that uh, they want to see move forward. And I think that's a good sign for all of us who are looking for ways to move forward um, uh, pieces of legislation. So just go to, I think the last slide here, um, you know, a few final thoughts. I think like I started on the beginning, it's a, it, it's a very cloudy outlook and I think it's gonna remain so. You're gonna continue to see a lot of hand wringing on these two big ticket items around build back better and voting rights, election reform and resolving fiscal year 2022 in that mix as well, particularly if there's a push to start carving up um, various bills to get them, get pieces passed if they can't do it in uh, you know, a couple of massive packages. You've got these committee activities that are going to be occurring and increasing over the next couple of weeks and months. So a sign of a return to some semblance of order and all things that stakeholders have to be mindful of and paying attention to as we move deeper into the year. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Caitlin. Great, thank you. We have one question for you. Um, someone is asking, what are the specific telehealth extension bills that are most supportive of the rare disease community? Um, I'll probably have to defer the where the community is question to some others on the call. There are several bills that are out there, um, some more widespread and sweeping, some more targeted. Most of them pertain to items like the, the Medicare requirements around originating sites of care to enable continued telehealth outside of having to be at a physician's office to initiate an appointment, um, which were sort of longstanding prohibitions, and you know, expanding telehealth for various um, various uses, but there are a number of bills that all have a flavor like that that connect back to essentially extending what was done during the public health emergency. But we can follow up with some of the specific bills that are out there, but I'll also see if the everyday folks have any thoughts on specifically with regard to the rare disease community on that one. Yeah, Caitlin, I can I can hop in a, a, just a little bit in that I noticed in the question they said, you know, particularly we're not um, for benefiting the patients that are not on Medicare. And that's a tough one because most of the bills are focused on uh, Medicare, uh, some um, some extend into, you know, Medicaid requirements, but really the the work on Medicaid and uh, private insurers is largely going to happen at the state level or, you know, within um, payer, individual payer decisions, but, you know, Medicare is a bellwether for a number of policies. And if the Medicare policies change, you know, the, the hope is that some of the um, others will follow. So it's not a great answer, but uh, it's what we've got so far, but I'm happy to follow up on this and um, reach back out with anything else that, that we can track down for you. Great. And thank you, Nick, for joining us today. We know you're in the car and on the go, but we appreciate you uh, jumping on to do this. You bet. Happy to be here. Thank you. And Jamie, I will- Have a great will... day. Bye all. Yes, you too. Jamie, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Caitlin. You can go on to the first slide or the next one. Sorry about the animations. All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you. Happy New Year. Um, thanks for joining us again uh, here in 2022. Certainly been off to um, uh, an interesting start to the year, uh, especially for all those are, who are home with their kids, uh, either in virtual school or weather related. Uh, it's, it's certainly going to be another interesting year. And, and we're, we're thinking of all of you uh, that are dealing with those complications. Um, so I'm going to just cover quickly um, a little broad overview of what are some of the issues we're going to be focusing on this year. Some of this will seem familiar. Um, others, you know, have, have evolved um, and will still evolve throughout the year. So, of course, we have uh, these are the four Every Life uh, Foundation core policy pillars. We work on diagnostics and newborn screening. We really, you know, our core goal of ending uh, the diagnostic odyssey for rare disease patients and families. Um, public policy really encompasses much of our legislative priorities, the work we do um, with Congress, and this year, as you'll hear in a bit, around uh, state policy as well. 
regulatory policy uh, focus, you know, working on how can we speed innovations to meet the, the unmet needs, the huge number, huge percentage of patients that have no treatment options. Um, and then, of course, access and value, uh, because, you know, it, a treatment that's approved but we can't get access to is certainly not um, beneficial. So those are the core areas we focus in. Uh, you can go on to the next one. So what you see here is our 2021 uh, legislative priorities grid. And I put this up because uh, 2022 is still a bit under construction. And that's because this is a grid that is formed with our community Congress network. Those are, those are our network of um, patient advocacy organizations, industry partners, pay, you know, professional societies, really all rare disease stakeholders who come together and help advise on what are the core issues, what are the priority issues that um, we can support, monitor, um, engage in, and lead, you know, in, um, with the rare disease community. So the meetings start later this month, and the community Congress working groups go through a process of updating and um, sort of finalizing this grid, though it is a living, breathing document throughout the year as new issues arise. Um, so you'll see some, this looks uh, familiar as as it did last year. Um, some of the issues that got added throughout the year uh, include things like the Past Year Act, which we talked about on a, a past webinar, uh, past RDLA webinar, Diverse Act, promoting diversity in clinical trials, um, and then some updates uh, that we expect to happen going forward uh, for 2022. You'll see issues uh, added that emerged late last year, such as the orphan drug tax credit and protecting it from um, further cuts and things like the accelerated approval issues uh, that really became very prominent uh, midway through last year and something that we fully intend to continue engaging in uh, this year. So while I can't show you 2022's grid, uh, this just gives you a little glimpse. Uh, there won't be a ton of changes, but I think you will see a few new issues added to this engaged section um, so that we can be sure that the rare disease voice is represented throughout these broader conversations. And so you can go to the next slide. Oh. One back. There we go. So you heard Nick talk a little bit about PDUFA as a must-pass uh, legislative uh, package this this year. Indeed, um, PDUFA process started uh, back in July 2020 and has been ongoing since. And we are just on the cusp of the now the process now shifting to Congress, uh, where FDA will transmit the proposed performance goals letter that outlines what the commitments that they've agreed to with industry with their negotiations. Uh, will be. And then throughout 2022, starting in early February, Congress will begin work to advance and enact PDUFA. You know, PDUFA, I know many of you are familiar with already, but in this year's PDUFA, there are really important provisions for the rare disease uh, community that we will be following, including you know, the establishment of new pilot projects to advance rare endpoint development um, to change up the review uh, process through incorporating more real-time communication. Um, there's you know, commitments to furthering PFDD efforts, patient-focused drug development, especially within the, the CBER side of FDA, that is the Center for Biologics Evaluation, so looking at cell and gene therapy especially. Uh, and then there's you know, policies that commit to advancing the use of real world evidence, innovative trial designs and digital health technologies, all of which have important implications for rare disease therapy development. So um, PDUFA engagement will continue to be a very important aspect of our 2022 work. And uh, especially because in, in many cases, it serves as a vehicle for advancing other regulatory uh, priorities that have been set in motion already with Congress. And then there's 21st Century Cures, which I believe we talked about last uh, RDLA webinar. And that bill was, uh, that process was started in early 2020, in early 2020, and then went through multiple rounds of stakeholder interactions, public comments, uh, giving, you know, working with uh, the, the bill leads to really come up with the, the bill that was introduced in November of 2021. There are, again, a number of important provisions for the rare disease community in Cures 2.0. Um, you know, I'm not going to rehash them all, but most you know, notably the inclusion of a rare disease center of excellence, um, working to establish ARPA-H, uh, improving access to genetic testing, you know, the list goes on. So these large packages, um, while the, the 21st Century Cures 2.0 path is, is a bit cloudy, uh, as to use Nick's words, uh, we are... Um, 
certainly going to continue engaging. We submitted comments on the draft um, on the bill that was introduced to the bill leads uh, just prior to the end of the year, uh, and those are on our website, I believe. Um, and you know, we're going to keep working with with members of the Congress to highlight the need for the many important provisions in QRS 2.0. Next slide. And of course, there is uh, the STAT Act. If you've been on any RDLA webinars, you're likely well familiar with the STAT Act. Uh, and if you are not, just a, a quick summary, it establishes the creation, you know, centers around the establishment of, of a rare disease center of excellence. But it really focuses on solving a number of, of other problems, especially those that are unique to the ultra rare community. And uh, on the, the challenge of facilitating earlier engagement between FDA and, and payers so that payers truly understand the evidence that has been used to support the approval and can inform you know, coverage decisions. So that's the shortest explanation of the STAT Act ever, but um, we would encourage you to check out the website if you are not familiar with the bill or just to check in and refresh um, before Rare Disease Week, that's statact.org. We made a lot of progress in 2021. It feels like a lifetime ago, but the bill was actually introduced in 2021. Uh, we had meetings with committee staff. We delivered letters of support with over 110 organizations. Thank you to those of you who are on the call that's, that have been supporting the STAT Act all the way. Um, we've been expanding our resources, and uh, we were especially pleased to see that rare disease, the Rare Disease Center of Excellence was included in, in Cure 2.0, as I mentioned. So in 2022, we're going to keep up this momentum. We're really looking forward to um, talking about STAT Act again in Rare Disease Week this year and growing support for the bill and awareness um, among Congress uh, for the need for the bill. Next slide. So then just uh, with newborn screening, uh, we have two of uh, both federal and state newborn screening uh, uh, priorities. If you aren't familiar, Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act has been expired since 2019, and that act authorizes critical elements of the newborn screening infrastructure and, and provides funding for it, including uh, the, the authorization for the federal committee that, uh, that decides what conditions go on the federal roofs panel. So we uh, urgently are working with partners, uh, some of you on this call, to pass the Newborn Screening Saves Lives Reauthorization Act this Congress. Uh, we are also working with partners to support robust appropriations for newborn screening. Uh, that their federal funding for newborn screening supports critical elements of the program, including follow-up services and quality control testing uh, and new test validation, among others. So we, we need to work together, united on robust appropriations uh, requests for newborn screening this year, as well as finishing last year's work. And then really building off the modernization study, which was just published, uh, if you haven't seen it, um, was published in JAMA Open Network uh, just at the end of the year, and we're really excited about that. And so really working again to identify policy solutions that will enable the long-term modernization of the newborn screening system. And that work will really be in high gear this year. Next slide. And then on the state level, uh, RUSP has you know, had a, a wildly successful year last year. Uh, we were able to uh, achieve with all of you uh, four RUSP uh, legislation last year. We worked to pass legislation in Arizona, Georgia, Ohio, North Carolina, um, and, and really with a minimal opposition and a lot of great advocacy from the community, we were, we were able to be successful. And we believe we can have a strong impact this year. Uh, the states that we're leading in this year are Maryland, Iowa, and Mississippi, uh, and that work is well underway. We had our first hearing yesterday in Mississippi, and just as a reminder, Russ alignment legislation is designed to set a predictable timeline and funding mechanism for states uh, to add new conditions to their newborn screening panel once they're added to the federal Russ. And so that will eliminate the need to go state by state by state and advocate for individual individual conditions to be added, um, which is just a huge lift for, for many communities to do. And, and this will, will end up um, adding conditions sooner and saving babies' lives. And that it, is absolutely a commitment of the foundation this year and beyond. So next slide, so my last one. 
Yep. Uh, so just a couple other things that, that weren't mentioned. You know, I, I love this quote. If you're not at the table, you'll you'll be on the menu. Uh, you know, we we are continuing to push for other rare disease appropriations priorities uh, so that they are not left out. Uh, things like NCATS funding, research funding, FDA resources for the, the Office of Orphan Products Development uh, and the grant program there, supporting important other reforms led by partner organizations, many of which you're about to hear from, and others like the, the Benefit Act, um, which you'll hear about during Rare Disease Week, and access issues that have been prioritized by our access working group, many of which happen at the state level. And so we're also really thrilled to be uh, able to add a new team member to the Avery Life Foundation to tackle state policy this year. Um, so that person started this week, uh, Bailey McGowan, I'm sure you'll hear from her in the future. And we'll, starting, we'll be starting to look at what issues we can really help get in on the ground at the state level, um, in addition to the rest uh, bills, of course. And then lastly, just we are, are going to continue to work to develop evidence and whether that be data or case studies or stories um, that can really empower all of your work and our work as well, um, so that we can keep pushing forward, uh, you know, rare disease policy solutions. So thank you all for being a part of, of uh, the Everly Foundation's policy efforts, and I'm looking forward to working with you throughout the year. Great, thank you, Jamie. We have one question for you. <clears throat> Someone is asking, are there any provisions or have there been any comments that speak to putting medical nutrition um, equity for rare or inborn errors under CURS 2.0? I'm not aware of any, but I can definitely um, work to find out. Uh, that is not something I, I have heard. Um, many of, uh, there aren't a ton of pure access um, related provisions in CURES 2.0. So it, we do need to, we would need to find a way to kind of fit that in to the, the theme of the bill, but um, certainly, you know, something that I can look into and, and get back with any answers I can find. Awesome, and there's one more question. Um, what is the status of the dismantling of the orphan drug tax credit and related, in, related incentives to develop rare disease drugs? Yeah, so um, as you recall, we have been talking last year uh, as one of the provisions that was proposed in the Build Back Better Act was to restrict the orphan drug tax credit, which had already been uh, sliced in half uh, a few years prior. So they proposed to restrict that credit to only the first rare disease uh, indication. And that would really put a damper on efforts that can um, truly take, take um, existing medications, you know, is approved therapies and repurpose them and study them to see if they're effective in other rare diseases. So we're very concerned about that as a huge dis, uh, disincentive for investing in those extra clinical trials and, and empowering rare disease patients with the evidence they need, you know, and clinicians with the evidence they need to know what treatment might also work for, for another condition. So, um, at the end of last year, uh, we were pushing full steam ahead on our advocacy efforts to um, you know, get that provision removed from the Build Back Better Act that was still included in the Senate version that, that was released, uh, but the process broke down uh, for now. And at the end of, of last year, you know, it became clear that right now there's not a path forward for the whole bill. So we remain engaged monitoring the issue, um, you know, collecting information and stories that, that will strengthen the advocacy efforts. But at this point, it's not yet clear if or how that will move forward. Great, thank you so much, Jamie. We appreciate all of your knowledge. Well, thank you for being here. And I know there's uh, potentially some questions in the chat once I'm off screen, I'll try to answer them. Perfect. So Ellie, we will pass it over to you. Great. First, I'd like to say I protest having to go after Jamie because she's so fabulous. <laughs> I'd say every life in RDLA, there's just not a stronger advocacy um, and lobbying um, force in Congress for good than, than you guys are. And um, I also just wanted to, to address this. Those last two questions, I think, are really important. 
um, medical nutrition. I feel the same way about wound care, um, that certain types of healthcare, you know, doesn't get the attention and the coverage that it deserves. And um, I think Research America would really love to be part of the solution there in um, terms of the Orphan Drug Act um, provisions and Build Back Better, as Jamie said there, right now looking at splitting up that big bill into smaller bills that possibly could be passed. I think um, the drug pricing provisions and drug related provisions like the Orphan Drug Act ones are some that are the least popular. Um, and so it's gonna be, um, it's gonna be very hard for folks to, I think, make the case for weakening the orphan um, drug tax um, incentives at the expense, particularly of the rare disease community. So we're we're on that one like white on rice too. Um, you know, uh, pretty much Jamie and um, before her, and I'm so sorry, I came on late. So I think it was Nick. Um, covered a lot of the same ground I would. I'd say that um, one of Research America's priorities is to blow the roof off NIH funding. Um, I think if the pandemic uh, conveyed any messages to us, thank you so much, coronavirus, um, it's that, you know, we need to treat the value of medical progress um, with a lot more respect, I'll say, than we have. Um, you know, our very future depends upon it. And, you know, it what it's over 800,000 lives, I think, in the United States that, that coronavirus has taken. You think about the number of lives rare disease takes, and we've got to treat medical progress differently. And so it's a, a big objective of Research America to, to kind of go bold with a dramatic uh, calls for dramatic increases in um, medical research funding in really important public health priorities um, and in R&D really across the board. Um, one area that I don't think has been mentioned because um, I haven't had a chance to talk to Every Life about this, but the, some work we have been doing also has to do with making sure patients and patient organizations in the rare disease community particularly have access to their natural history data so that it's not cordoned off. If, if they participate in research, they should have access to their data to make sure that it, it goes somewhere and is used for the purposes that those patients, um, you know, subjected typically their kids to these clinical research uh, studies. So it's an area we're working on with NIH in particular. Uh, another priority for us is ARPA-H. Um, we really do think that there is value in standing up an incubator that sits kind of at the um, nexus of what the private sector is working on and what government is willing to work on. Um, one of our priorities that is relevant to the rare disease community is the way that ARPA-H would look at developing priorities. We would be strongly opposed to a burden of disease measure that looks at sheer numbers um, or costs, because for one thing, the costs associated with rare disease are not adequately captured in this country or in any country. Um, and the burden in terms of numbers, um, if you look across rare diseases is as high as um, these big ticket diseases like heart disease. So one thing we're, we're, we're really um, working on, we've been invited to comment on the ARPA-H um, build out in, everywhere that it's being discussed at the administration level, on the House side, on the Senate side, is that priorities should attend to both rare diseases and more common diseases. And one major reason for that is that you never know where the next finding is going to be a breakthrough for all diseases. And we've seen that with things like CRISPR. So if ARPA-H limits itself, it limits its societal benefit. And um, so that's an area that's important for us. Um, we also, um, relevant to the rare disease community um, and important generally, I think is the genetic testing, coverage for genetic testing um, under the, the compromised version of the Precision Medicine um, Answer for Kids Today Act. Um, I don't know what it's called now. I think it's got a different name and it's part of Cures 2.0, but to us that just to, 
to um, make sure that that is available, um, it, it, you know, to all, so that it it's it's not a um, one of these things where some families have to go through this diagnostic journey and some families do not. Not okay. Um, not in society's interest. And so that's an area that we're working with in, in support of every life um, and other advocates. Um, we also are very interested in making sure that pandemic preparedness is treated as a, a pandemic response imperative. The, we, the United States needs to get going and um, take some actions that need to happen. For example, um, there are knowledge gaps that leave us very vulnerable to the next pandemic. They have to be filled. Um, there's a really strong potential to develop a universal vaccine if, if NIH and its partners in the private sector find the right target. The target that they have been focusing on now, they know is vulnerable to mutations. Um, and so it's very hard to make a universal uh, vaccine based on something where it can mutate. And so they're looking for different targets. Um, and it's, so there's very important work in that arena. And we're really trying to raise the profile of um, starting that work, funding that work now as the next step um, when there is another supplemental. And we think there will be. Um, I know that I think we've talked that you've already talked about what's going on in Congress, but we expect probably another short term resolution that um, gives Congress time to negotiate an omnibus and a supplemental. We think that'll happen. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of messiness today, particularly about whether Build Back Better will um, lead to a year long continuing resolution, flat funding under the federal government. That would be a tragedy for this country, um, a tragedy for pandemic response and preparedness. So we're fighting very hard against that. And I don't think it'll happen. Um, let me see if I've there are so many things that we're working on and I am not covering all of them. Clinical trials diversity, we're trying to secure a consensus conference between with FDA and NIH just to really talk about um, common definitions of what uh, clinical trials diversity means, um, how you get there, how you measure it, how you make sure you're, you're um, actually defining diversity in a way that um, conveys the most value to patients and to medical progress. Um, CARES 2.0 has a lot of very cool provisions in it. We're for it. We're working with um, reps to get an Upton very closely and, um, you know, looking forward to seeing that bill move. Uh, we are working on PDUFA, just like um, Every Life is. Again, there's some really important um, provisions in that in terms of early communication, trying to get to approvals in a responsible way, but faster. Um, we feel like there still needs to be more clarity for uh, gene therapy and uh, cell therapy and other, um, you know, promising, promising approaches for the rare disease uh, community so that um, FDA can approve therapies, get them out the door to patients, and then we've got to talk about affordability. Um, so Research America is kind of looking at all of these things, um, and mostly we want to partner closely, continue to partner closely with Every Life and with the individual rare groups that are on this call. Um, you know, you can get my cell right from my address, my email. Call me if there are things that you're working on that we can help with. Um, and you know, obviously, we'll continue to um, keep Jamie very close. Um, we'd love to hire her, Jamie. So if you want to come on and over and leave every life, just let me know. <laughs> and I will, um, I'll stop there. Annie might object to that one. <laughs> <laughs> All of the Every Life team, uh, we adore and RDLA uh, for very good reasons. Well, thank you, Ellie. We appreciate that. We appreciate you joining us. Um, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, someone said one big issue that they see in their disease group is that parents are not understanding the mutation that their child has. Um, and because of this, um, they aren't understanding if their child will have neurological issues as they grow up. Um, so they're asking, is there a way that genetic counselors can help with that in the future? Wow, that sounds like that would seem like it should be kind of a, a right built into what they do. 
Um, I'll follow up on that. Um, I, I'd love to. I'd love to follow up and see what's going on there. And it, because it's a brilliant idea, if it's not already standardized, um, it's it seems like it should be a no brainer. So um, I, I'll definitely look into that. I'm going to write it down right now. Thank you so much. Absolutely. David, we will go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Caitlin. Um, and thanks again for um, inviting uh, PMC back to uh, share our priorities again with you all this year. It doesn't feel like it was a year ago since I was last here at the beginning of 20, uh, 2021. Um, and, and I agree, uh, Jamie certainly created a, a hard act to follow, but um, it's, it's really great to see a lot of uh, synergy and overlap in, in our priorities. Um, so just some uh, background about um, uh, the Personalized Medicine Coalition. So um, we are an organization that has um, over 200 uh, members that span the healthcare spectrum, representing um, healthcare institutions, patient advocacy groups, um, pharmaceutical and diagnostic companies, as well as health IT companies, um, and every life of, we're proud to have as a member. Um, and uh, our members represent an array of disease areas, um, all with an interest in advancing um, this approach to care so that at the end of the day, uh, personalized medicine can, can benefit uh, patients like you. Um, and next slide, please. Um, and so um, just to define uh, personalized medicine, so for us, um, personalized medicine is a fast growing approach to healthcare. Um, in which physicians use information from uh, diagnostic tests along with the patient's uh, medical history to guide prevention and treatment plans that are consistent with uh, the patient's biology values and circumstances. Um, the diagnostic tests that are used in personalized medicine help identify um, biological markers um, in a patient's biology, and these are often uh, genetic. And knowing what biomarkers an individual has um, allows doctors to better understand how a health condition affects that patient. Um, these can be uh, present in the patient's DNA or in the case of a cancer, the tumor's DNA, and um, are really important uh, for the rare disease community and um, coming to a diagnosis. Um, and so these biomarkers can do a number of things, um, help evaluate the likelihood that a patient will develop a disease, about a uh, diagnosed disorder, um, evaluate the severity of a disorder um, or its likely progression, determine optimal treatment strategies or even a patient's um, eligibility for targeted treatments, um, and finally monitor a patient's response to, to treatment. And um, so this approach to care uh, in combination with consideration of the patient's values, circumstances, and medical history uh, helps physicians uh, direct treatments to only those patients whose biological characteristics make them uh, most likely uh, to benefit. Um, and personalized medicine uh, plays an important role in uh, helping, as I mentioned, to diagnose rare diseases, um, as well as developing uh, treatments uh, based on their genetic origins. Um, each year, uh, we release a report highlighting personalized medicines that have been approved by the FDA. Um, and since 2015, uh, personalized medicines have accounted for uh, more than a quarter of all new treatments approved uh, by the FDA. And um, over the past decade, we have seen uh, a growing trend of approvals outside of oncology, especially in areas like rare disease, um, where treatments are designed to um, reverse uh, the, the root causes um, of these conditions. And so we're currently analyzing uh, the approvals from 2021, but uh, we do expect these uh, trends to continue. Um, and uh, much like every life, um, every year we do go through a policy priority setting exercise with our members. Um, and we have a, a rubric as well that has um, 45, uh, more than 45, I think, uh, different uh, issues that fall into four buckets, uh, modernizing regulatory policies, modernizing coverage and payment policies, advancing innovation and in care delivery and the value of personalized medicine, um, as well as cultivating support for personalized medicine. And there are, there are many topics that I could cover from that policy agenda today, but um, I'll focus on some of um, our legislative priorities that I think um, will be of particular interest to you all. And um, I think have for the most part already been covered. Um, next slide, please. And um, so first, um, I'd like to uh, share some information about the Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus. 
Um, so with the support of our members a couple of years ago, um, we set out to educate members of Congress about personalized medicine, its benefits and challenges, and uh, discuss how a caucus uh, focused on uh, advancing personalized medicine could benefit patients as well as the healthcare system. And so as a result of this multi-year effort, um, a bipartisan uh, bicameral group of lawmakers uh, came together to launch uh, the caucus uh, shortly before the pandemic. Um, this is co-chaired by Senators Kirsten Sinema and Tim Scott, as well as representatives um, Eric Swalwell and Tom Emmer. And um, while the caucus does not focus on uh, any disease in particular, uh, we do believe that um, it complements uh, the work of many of the other disease caucuses, including the Rare Disease Caucus. And so uh, one of our um, top legislative priorities this year is to uh, continue growing the, the membership in the caucus. Uh, we also plan to hold uh, two educational uh, briefings this year, uh, hopefully uh, uh, in person, uh, if things get uh, back to normal sooner rather than later. Um, and also uh, we do plan to engage the caucus um, around a number of the key provisions and uh, the user fee, uh, packages as well as uh, Cures 2.0 um, that will help benefit uh, patients uh, with personalized medicine. Um, and so you can find more information um, about the caucus, including a list of members on our website. Um, and we do invite you to share information about the caucus um, with your members of Congress um, or offices your organization uh, has a relationship with. Um, next slide, please. And um, so uh, we've already talked um, uh, several times about user fees and Cures 2.0 discussions. And so I won't go into too much depth there, but I'll just say that, um, you know, these as uh, uh, broad sweeping uh, packages, um, they offer multiple opportunities to advance personalized medicine. And many of these provisions uh, do stand to benefit um, their disease community. Some of our um, priority areas uh, include uh, FDA staffing needs, especially as it relates to uh, cell and gene therapies, um, uh, real world evidence and real world data. Um, these can make um, significant uh, contributions in advancing our understanding uh, which uh, patients will benefit um, from particular treatments. Um, and so we're certainly committed to um, advancing um, a number of the proposals, including uh, pilot programs, uh, public workshops, um, updates on guidances, um, digital health technologies. Um, so digital health technologies um, or devices and their related software that collect uh, health information um, hold the potential for enhancing trial efficiency as well as collecting real world evidence and providing uh, insights about um, uh, at the point of care about how to uh, get the right treatment to the right patient um, at the right time. Um, and then finally, uh, decentralized trials. Uh, these are conducted uh, remotely through telemedicine and local healthcare providers while patients remain at home during a significant portion um, or for all of the study. And uh, thanks to innovations in digital health technologies and the growing use of telemedicine, uh, decentralized uh, trials uh, promise to provide uh, more patients with access to um, investigational therapies and increase patient participation uh, in research. Um, and uh, finally, uh, coverage modernization. So the Cures 2.0 Act um, also includes an entire uh, uh, section with provisions on how to improve coverage and reimbursement. Um, and many of these uh, stand to benefit personalized medicine. Um, and um, there is one uh, particular provision I'd like to focus on, which is the uh, Precision Medicine Answers for Kids Today Act. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so some of you um, are probably already familiar, but there have been previous iterations of this bill through the Advancing Access to Precision Medicine Act or the ending uh, the Diagnostic Addison Act. And uh, for the past several years, uh, PMC has been engaged in uh, resolving uh, differences between uh, the competing legislative uh, proposals that would expand coverage for genetic testing and genomic sequencing services that are needed by rare disease pediatric patients on Medicaid, um, as well as conduct a National Academy of Medicine study on the clinical and economic uh, value of genomic sequencing. And over the last year, um, PMC, along with uh, the Every Life Foundation, the Assistant Fund, uh, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, as well as 
Um, a number of others in the uh, patient advocacy community um, worked with offices to develop a joint uh, standalone bill. Uh, this was introduced as HR uh, 5989 uh, by representatives Eric Swalwell, Peters, and Emmer, and also included um, in the Cures to a Point O Act as Section 407. And um, we're really excited uh, to see this move forward um, in the Cures 2.0 package. And uh, we'll continue to advocate um, for its inclusion alongside um, Every Life and others. Um, and so if you uh, think your members of Congress would be interested in supporting this bill or co-sponsoring, um, I'd encourage you to uh, direct their office to um, Sarah Shapiro and uh, Rep uh, Representative Swalwell's um, office. And I'll uh, stop there for questions. Great, thank you, David. Let's see. Um, we do have one question. Um, someone is asking your opinion on the current CDC opioid prescribing guidelines. Um, they said, what does it take to get personalized pain care for those with identified um, altered drug metabolism? Um, to be honest, I'm not familiar um, with that proposal, but I'm happy to take note of it. And if you could uh, just uh, make sure I have um, the individual's contact information, I'm happy to uh, do what I can to respond offline. Perfect. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here. Of course, thanks for having us. Of course. And now we have Jennifer. Hi, everybody. I'm so happy to be back here. I'm Jennifer Dexter with the National Health Council. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the National Health Council, we're an organization that's been around for more than 100 years, made up of approximately 140 organizations, primarily patient advocacy groups. Those that you see on this list, you'll see lots of familiar names. Um, but we also have membership that represents uh, the research community, uh, nonprofits with an interest in health, some of the professional associations around providers and insurers, the biopharmaceutical industry. Um, so we bring in all those other voices, but everything that we do is led by and um, uh, stacked in favor of the patient community. Um, so these are the organizations we most work most closely with. Um, and we work every year to develop our policy priorities in conjunction with these groups. We do um, several processes, working with our board, working, um, surveying out through our membership, working with our policy committees, working with the government relations professionals from these um, organizations to help winnow it down to what are the things that are of most importance to National Health Council. And one of the things that makes us unique, when I move to the next slide, you'll see a lot of overlap with the things that you have you have heard. And we work very closely with everybody that's spoken so far, if they're not in, even if they're not in membership, um, is that we bring to the table a voice that is inclusive of all diseases, all patient states. So we don't work on things that are disease specific. Um, we only do federal. Um, and we move forward on that. So you'll see, let's get to the next slide. This will look familiar. We also put our policy priorities into what we call our matrix. Um, and these are things that if you look at the bottom um, uh, axis, these are things that are most important to the patient advocacy community. And then the left axis is our ability as a membership organization to influence and impact those things. So it divides into four quadrants, things that the National Health Council is going to lead on and things that we're going to partner on. Those are the two areas we spend the most time because those are the most important to the patient advocacy community. Um, so I'm gonna touch on a couple of those. Looking at areas where we lead, um, looking very closely at healthcare costs. So what is the transparency of how we price uh, and pay for healthcare? Um, what are the way, what, on what basis do we contract for healthcare? Are we using outcomes that are important to the patient? Um, what value are we assigning to treatments and care? How do we look at things and figure out how much it's worth to the individual, how much it's worth to the system, what it should cost? making sure that the patient's voice and the patient's uh, priorities are, are prioritized in that. Um, Medicare Part D, looking at how we're working very closely on um, provisions in the Build Back Better Act to provide a cap on 
what the out-of-pocket for an individual would be and the ability for them to smooth those costs over a year. So pay, pay them down in installments, basically. So those are some of our cost uh, priorities. Looking at access to care, um, reducing all access barriers. Um, you know, we know, particularly in the rare disease community, there are so many things that stand between an individual and getting a diagnosis and getting treatment and getting um, prescriptions and all of that. So how do we address those as they arise? Um, FDA, we've worked really closely with Every Life and others over the years to really develop a pretty vibrant patient engagement relationship at FDA. Um, that is still growing at CMS. So they're making those decisions about coverage and, um, and issues around care. We wanna make sure they have the as vibrant and uh, strong patient engagement process. Access to telehealth falls under, under access. Um, really our priority is to make sure that telehealth is an option when a patient and a provider work together to figure out for that individual, it is the best option. Um, Looking at medical innovation, which is really bringing new treatments and uh, devices and drugs to the market. Um, we're working hand in hand with everybody on this call around looking, creating as strong a, a PDUFA a user fee agreement as we can. Um, you'll see over in the monitor box, we also do the same for generics and medical devices and, um, and all of that. Um, but PDUFA is really where the, the biggest action is right now. Um, looking at patient caregiver engagement. Um, and again, looking at how do we get data and experience data from patients in a way that really collects what they find most important, what their real experiences with, with treatment and with care. Um, you can see in the partner box, um, a lot of insurance coverage issues. Those are um, really front and center to what we do. We just work very much in coalition on that. That actually moved recently from the lead to the partner only because some of the coalition work had gotten so strong. Looking at appropriations for healthcare across the board, um, looking at how we uh, count what people pay out of pocket under their insurance coverage for copay accumulators and things like that, um, and looking at how we measure quality. Um, some of the things that we engage as needed um, are gonna be those pandemic preparedness issues that, that Ellie talked a lot about and some others did too long COVID support, the public health infrastructure, um, disease prevention, a lot of just health and environmental work there, um, and the healthcare workforce. And then finally, I said the, the monitor issues, um, which are the other user fee agreements and opioids and pain management, um, which we've already had a question about. Finally, you'll see in the middle, um, we've, we worked long and hard to figure out where to put this actually in this box visually. Um, and equity and health equity is in the center because it really does um, infuse all of our work and everything we're doing. We spent the last year and a half really leading efforts to bring the patient community and the health ecosystem together to figure out from the patient's point of view, what are those things that we can change that will increase um, equity in our healthcare system. Um, we are getting ready on February 1st to release some specific policy priorities around the four key areas we have identified access to care delivery and quality of care delivery, um, equity in insurance coverage, um, equity and medical innovation, that's really about diversity in clinical trials and the makeup of the research workforce and all of that. Um, and finally, partnering with organizations that work on social determinants of health, and that's things like access to housing and nutrition, transportation, education, all of those things, bringing the patient voice into that. Um, so with that, I know we're getting tight on time, so I will wrap it up, but um, I, I just want to end by saying how much I value the partnerships of the organizations that have spoken today, um, that are leading the, these webinars, and that are on the call as well. Um, and I thank you all. Thank you so much, Jennifer. So lastly, we will move to Shannon, who is going to give us some updates on Rare Disease Week. Hello, I was just trying to answer one more question in the Q&A box. I'll do that as soon as I'm done, if anyone is waiting. Um, but yeah, I wanted to give a quick update um, and reminder for Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill 2022. It will be virtual in case you did not hear that already. Uh, and registration is open and you can find that at rareadvocates.org slash 
RDW. Um, and we are working uh, fast and furiously as we're um, almost a month away um, from virtual rare disease week on Capitol Hill. Um, and so we're gonna be starting on February 22nd with the rare disease caucus briefing and a documentary screening in the evening. And then we will start out Wednesday the 23rd with the legislative conference in the afternoon for those on the East Coast and morning for those on the West Coast. Um, and so that'll be about like a four or five hour day if you were to participate for all of our sessions during legislative conference. And then on the 24th, we'll pick up again at the same time um, for the second part of the legislative conference um, and have a YAR meetup for young adults um, between the ages of 16 and 30 in the evening following the legislative conference. I really encourage everyone who plans to attend the virtual meetings with their representatives and or senators uh, to participate as much as they can in the legislative conference. You're gonna get the most up-to-date information on the asks and what is happening on Capitol Hill um, before you head to those meetings a few days later. So I really encourage um, everyone to participate in the legislative conference. Um, I know that it is a lot of events and a lot going on, but I, I would say um, I suggest prioritizing the, that if you plan to attend the virtual meetings. Um, and then the next week, um, NIH is hosting Rare Disease Day at NIH on Monday the 28th. Um, and you can register for that separately. The link is on our website, so you can go straight from our website to there to register. And then we will be uh, scheduling meetings for those who want to participate in virtual meetings with our representatives and senators on the first and second. So RDLA schedules those meetings for you. You're usually in a group of advocates from your district or your state, unless you're from an itty bitty district or um, low population state. Um, but generally uh, you will have others in the meeting with you or um, Every Life RDLA staff. Um, we do our best to make sure that no one is attending uh, meetings on their own. And so to get ready for Rare Disease Week and those meetings with your senators and representatives, we do host uh, quite a few webinars to prepare. Um, just a heads up that registration closes on February 11th. We will be hosting just a general training webinar where we'll share what the four asks during Rare Disease Week will be um, and other pertinent information so you can get started uh, preparing um, on February 2nd. And then February 9th, for those who have volunteered to be team coordinators and are assigned to be team coordinators, we will host a webinar for you on February 9th. Uh, we're hosting again on February 10th, a Share Your Story with Policymakers webinar. This will have the coaches, um, and this is a really useful and helpful webinar if you haven't participated in meetings with your uh, representatives before. Um, so we'll go through how you make an ask, um, and then we'll allow time for you to practice your ask with a coach and, and others in, in different breakout rooms. And so that's actually a, a very fun and useful webinar for those who haven't done it before. Uh, and then of course, we're gonna host our office hours again this year. This, this is just a time for um, attendees to stop in, ask questions about their schedule or what to expect or really um, anything. Caitlin and I are on a Zoom meeting and you can join um, on February 11th or 14th and then one special for team coordinators on the 15th. And then of course we are doing our scavenger hunt during rare disease week again. So if you participated in it last year uh, during rare disease week, this was a fun way to get points throughout rare disease week for different activities, actions, um, we called them challenges. And so the top 50 point earners will win um, a grant for an organization of their choice to be made by the Every Life Foundation in their name between $1,000 and $5,000. So this is a great way to participate, uh, do as much as you can during Rare Disease Week, get points and earn some money for your favorite rare disease organization. 
And here's just a little shout out that if you are from any of these states or know any rare disease advocates from these states, we would love to have you or them register for Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. Um, our registration is a little bit low in these states. Um, none of these are shockers, but <laughs> we really love to um, hit as many states as we possibly can and make sure that we are meeting with as many representatives and senators from the country as possible during Rare Disease Week on Capitol Hill. So um, please register or encourage others to register if you know anyone from Maine, Mississippi, Montana, North Dakota, Puerto Rico, South Dakota, the Virgin Islands, or Wyoming. And I would just put this out there too, that if you've never participated in Rare Disease Week before, or um, you know, others who haven't. Uh, I think that the virtual Rare Disease Week is a really nice way to step into advocacy. Uh, it's a lot less intimidating and um, a lot easier than traveling across the country, for instance, to Washington, D.C. Um, and so this is these virtual Rare Disease Weeks are actually a really nice way just to get started if you haven't done it before. So that's it for me, I think, Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you so much, Shannon. And if anyone has any questions related to Rare Disease Week, you can find uh, my email or Shannon's on our website. Feel free to reach out um, with any questions that you may have. Um, I want to get one last question in really quick for Jamie. Um, someone is asking um, about advocacy work related to the Oregon Medicaid waiver under consideration. Sure. Uh, so great question. Uh, we, there is a proposal in Oregon uh, to uh, submit a new 1115 waiver request to CMS. That's a waiver that is used to allow states to make changes to their Medicaid program from what is required by CMS. And Oregon has proposed some concerning changes related to um, closing their formulary, so restricting excuse me, what drugs are available, but more concerning um, still is that they have proposed all of giving Medicaid, giving their program the ability to um, restrict access to medications approved via the accelerated approval pathway. And uh, not only would this be bad for Oregon, it would be bad you know, in, for the precedent it would set and um, the likelihood that other states would follow not far behind. So it's something we're very concerned about. We submitted comments to Oregon a health authority during their open comment period that ended earlier this month. And we will continue to monitor the process and there will be more opportunity for the community to weigh in once that application goes to CMS. CMS and CMS puts out um, puts it out for public comment. So more to come and um, great great question. It's something we should all be you know aware of and have on the radar moving forward. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, our next webinar is going to be February seventeenth at noon. We hope you'll all be able to come back and join us. Um, if you're interested in uh, speaking on the webinar or presenting on a particular topic. Um, please reach out to me. My email is on the screen. If you're calling in, it's klaws at everylifefoundation.org. And thank you to our sponsors for today's webinar. Um, thank you all for joining us. Caitlin, bye everyone. Bye. Thank you everyone.